All right, everybody. I'm a little biased, but I think we saved the best for last. So thank you so much for your time and attention this whole weekend. Uh, we're excited to introduce you today to Dr. Cabisiero. Um, he's the Director of Electrophysiology at Deborah Heart and Lung in Browns Mills, New Jersey. He's spoken hundreds of times all over the world about CRT, so we are honored to have him here today to talk cardiac resynchronization therapy, a patented approach. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Wow, this sounds loud. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna tell a, a little story. Uh, this is a personal story of what I've gone through with CRT, so I'll try to wrap up 10 years of work in 20 minutes. So um, I call this a patented approach. So the definition of a patent, uh, a government license conferring a right or title for a set period, especially the sole right to exclude others from making, using, or selling an invention. So I thought that was interesting. So I looked up some patents and there's a patent for animal track footwear. There's a patent for wearable table. There's a patent for guarding your mustache or protecting your dog's ears. And there's even a patent for anti-eating face mask. So in looking at this, I thought, ah, how hard could these patent things be, right? So I decided to try, we try to come up with our own. So this is our patent approach. This is a method uh, for device uh, managing pacing therapy based on intra intraventricular sept excuse me, septal activity. So this is the formula that we use. And if you look at this from top to bottom, we work on ventricular timing. And then the rest of the formula is working on uh, AV timing. And we'll go into this further. This is uh, the first diagram. And um, we'll go over this again. But this is looking at a way of measuring septum to right activation something we call the SRAT. This is the diagram that we set up for ventricular timing. This is, has a little bit of an unusual twist. If you look at this, this is LV pacing to RV sensing, which we'll go into. And this is uh, putting, putting the SRAT, the AV, the V to V timing, putting it all together into this formula in order to try to bring together all the wave fronts to minimize activation time. So what we envisioned in our background of this is we were trying to get a four-fold wavefront so that everything can combine together to have minimal activation time. And it's something we called multi-fuse. OK, so if necessity is the mother of invention, discontent is the father of progress. So we were looking for a quicker way of doing things. So we had a lot of information. If you know, we have a lot of programming. Um, uh, options, uh, but we were trying to put all the dots together to try to make into one formula that we could use. So this is sort of the basis of how we do this. If you think about AV timing, right, AV, uh, the timing through the atrium down to the AV node, there are certain parts that are fixed and there are certain parts that are variable. And the one thing that's variable is really the AV node. And what we're going to do is play with that, right, to keep the fixed timing of the septum to see if we can contribute to that to all the ventricular pacing. So this can only be done with a St. Jude device. You have to have a customized uh, EGM configuration of the RV coil to the LV distal tip, which you set up. Uh, and then you look at the EGM display. OK, and this configuration allows us to look across the septum. OK, then we go to the temporary screen. We ensure it for intrinsic conduction. And with native activation, we take a look and try to come up with septal activation the time to the right side, to the right ventricular lead, which we call septal to right activation time, or the SRAT. And here's a blow up of it. And you can see we look from the onset of the customized RV, uh, LV1 tip uh, to the peak of the RV coil. OK, and here you can see it measures out to 62 milliseconds. And this is sort of a blow up that so you can see quite easy. Th this is the customized setup. We look across the septum and take it up to the peak of the RV, and we're calling this um, the SRAT. What we're doing then with the SRAT is using sync AV, cutting it in half to try to peel back sync AV to allow for septal activation to contribute to all the ventricular leads pacing at the same time. This is the setup now. Um, 
that we use for um, the ventricular timing. We, again, a little bit uh, nov novice, we're using LV pacing to RV sensing, taking the longest time and making that LV1, and then the next longest would be, uh, I mean the next shortest would be the LV2. And this is how this is set up. Um, as you see, we're gonna use the concept of anatomic spacing as we pick our LV1 sites for pacing and to RV sensing. And this is what it looks like in this example. We're doing uh, the LV pacing uh, in our first vector and we're getting uh, to the RV at 38 milliseconds. In the next one, it's going to be 42. So this is going to be our LV1 setup. Uh, and then the next one, the other one was going to be our LV2 setup. And again, this is all based on anatomic spacing, which I'll get into in just a bit. So for the final programming of this, we take 30 milliseconds, which is half our SRAT. We take the slowest LV to RV and make it LV1. And then we take the, the next slowest, which is uh, LV2. So the formula for this uh, patent is basically determining the SRAT, uh, cutting it in half, and using that for sync AV, allowing that peeling back to allow for septal activation, and then programming our ventricular, okay? So that's sort of the story of the patent. Um, so to figure out, we might as well get started about how this story came about. So remember that um, we're talking about the CS lead, right? So now we live in a time of quadrupolar technology. Keep in mind that a lot of our, our data that what we've based on has been based on bipolar technology. So everything has to be taken with a grain of salt. In terms of the quadrupolar lead, just some interesting stuff that I'm sure we all know, but this is the excellent Tarakia paper that looked at bi-V versus quadrupolar uh, pacing, and it actually showed that there was a mortality benefit to a quadrupolar lead. Um, this is from the quad pass registry that's about to be published that we're in for the country. We had 1,900 patients with excellent pacing thresholds, and basically the quadrupolar lead one of the biggest and first things that we learned about it is it allows or ensures for CRT therapy to, to be delivered, all right? We can avoid PNS in over 98% of the patients. This is one of our papers. This is the US paper that we had, uh, and this is for Leo's Italian paper. The quad lead is even cost effective. We went out and proved that. In terms of the quadrupolar lead, the leads that you choose have to have enough spacing. Uh, so most of the leads will allow for anatomic spacing um, some of them are somewhat limited in our choices. Okay, so do we start top down or bottom up? So real knowledge is intrinsic and built from the ground up. So why don't we start talking about the QRS? Okay, so this is um, a funny story. So with all of the imaging techniques we have when we're looking at our problem for CRT, uh, we still use the QRS. Right? We're still using the QRS in this day. And I remember my funny story. This is an ode to the great Dr. Josephson. When I trained in Massachusetts, we used to have, um, at the time, what's called mass EP meetings. And so fellows would have to go and present cases. And I remember I presented this elaborate case and all my calculations, to which Dr. Josephson stood up and told everybody that all this shows me is you don't know how to read an EKG. So. I kind of remember that and probably still true, so. <laughs> anyway, so what we're using the QRS still, and that's what we're using as our surrogate when we're talking about CRT. So if we can get QRS narrowing, that's really gonna be our surrogate for what we're looking at. So when we're looking at QRSs, the pre-EKG uh, is very important, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but also very much so the post-EKG. Can we get the most QRS narrowing for, to get the most benefit? So when we're setting up our CRT, this is sort of, no pun intended, the gold standard, right? So when we're placing our lead, a lot of us look at QLV to see the best place to put our lead. Well, we kind of uh, thought about it at our place. Um, CRT is really a pacing therapy. So instead of looking at QLV, we, set, we decided to look at PLV. And this is something called the uh, PACE trial. We did a randomized trial into this area. Um, when we look in this area, right, we have to explore it, right? We have to go into the different branches and see where the best place to pacing is. But again, instead of using the QLV, we used paste LV, right? And this was our trial. We had a broke down small trial, but we got it published um, that looked at a randomization one-to-one -one 
versus, uh, versus PLV versus QLV. And basically what we found, not statistically significant, but trending in the direction of PLV uh, being more beneficial. But not statistically significant, but clearly, you know, there's something, an alternative that could be used when we're setting this up. And in some, you have to remember in some patients, right, there's no alternative. If they're patient dependent, you have to use PLV. So the concept of, of pacing to use to set up our, our, our LV timing was kind of interesting. And we came up with this paper and sort of looking at it, this is sort of, again, the basis of what you see in the patent. So if you use LV pacing from the, from the CS branch, essentially epicardial, and we read that pacing from the area of greatest stim latency from LV pacing, the slowest LV time was a great predictor of outcomes. So this is what sort of is in our paper, uh, in our patent, looking at LV to RV sense, okay? So we're doing P to the RV. And that's the conclusion of that paper. So again, that's what we're using when we go back to the patent. And again, this is, everybody knows, the concept of, of multipoint pacing, trying to overcome boundaries by multiple points. And, and with the use of anatomic spacing, this could be of benefit. When we come to MPP, um, some of the data that we looked at, we looked at uh, Iron MP, the Italian registry, that looked at there was some, some benefit to that. Of course, this was not a trial, it was a registry. In more CRT, uh, essentially a negative MPP trial, there were some hints that, that some um, uh, patient populations might benefit. Uh, here we see it in class three or four heart failure. And then we see this, this trend of maybe even helping in non-left bundle patients. This is Xanon, which was typical of many small studies that looked at MPP to show that it was uh, beneficial regardless of etiology and regardless of QRS morphology. But still, oh, this is the MPP IDE trial, and this is where the concept of anatomic spacing came, where we had greatest improvement when we had the pulls at least 30 millimeters apart, okay? But still, um, in looking at all this, MPP never really got a lot of traction. In fact, if you look at it throughout the country, most people ask what it is and leave it off, right? So we decided to look at this, were we not using it in the right way or on the right patients? And our concept was, um, was size going to be important in the use of MPP? So here, this is a breakdown of the MPP IDE patients that, uh, that we ran. And if you looked at this, the conclusion was that conventional biventricular single site pacing, even with quadrupolar lead, has reduced efficacy in patients with LV enlargement. And the greatest response in patients with larger hearts were observed when you used MPP with anatomic spacing. So to us, this was kind of a, uh, a thing that, uh, 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 an idea that made sense, right? We, you know, who are the greatest responders to CRT? Typically, non-ischemic women. Right? And if you think about it, you can kind of make yourself believe that the smaller heart may be easier to, to recover resynchronization than larger hearts. And here you can see the larger hearts with the use of MPP had the most benefit for our patients. So we thought that this made sense, explained some gender issues and whatnot, but maybe this is where we should be targeting MPP. So when it comes to resynchronization, this might be a lot different for these two patients. So for MPP, maybe size does matter, okay? All right. So in terms of the V timing, uh, this is just an example of what we can do when we do by V pacing and add MPP, and again, looking for our surrogate of narrowing the QRS. Okay. So moving up from the QRS now to the AV node, we quote Einstein when we say, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity, so let's go through how we set this up, okay? In terms of AV conduction, um, I kind of remind everyone that we shouldn't forget about AV delay, AV block, first degree AV block, okay? We've known as way back as the Framingham trial that a prolonged PR interval increases AFib, increases CHF hospitalizations, increases mortality, okay? So let's not forget it. I, and again, very, very uh, old trials looking at a number of things across the board in terms of AFib, pacemaker implantation, but mainly AFib, uh, uh, first degree of heart block associated with heart failure. This is the heart and soul. This was an ischemic trial that looked at patients 
uh, with first degree heart blocks, and you can see the mortality difference occurring just at a at a, a first degree of 220 milliseconds. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, everybody has, uh, every company has their own AV uh, algorithm, uh, Sync AV, their Smart AV, and then it's Adaptive CRT. Um, this, I'll talk a little bit about how Sync AV works. This is a nice dynamic way of, of, uh, of um, using uh, AV conduction. Again, this is every 256 cycles, we'll measure it, and then it's a programmable uh, delta to make sure that you're ensuring uh, LV pacing. So this is uh, from, from Dr. Varma. He looked at 75 patients undergoing CRT with intact AV conduction, and he used patient-specific programming. This was not an MPP paper. This was just st a standard by V. And he, under, he went through the, the modes of these patients, um, nominal, um, uh, by V with Sync AV, at nominal, by V with Sync AV that was optimized, and then LV only uh, with Sync AV to allow for uh, native AV conduction. And if you can see here, he got the greatest QRS narrowing when he used um, by V with Sync AV that he optimized. So he optimized it to get the greatest narrowing. So in order to achieve the best results for the QRS, we have to pay attention to electrical parameters like the AV delay. Okay. So here we worked on, we got our ventricular timing. Now let's try to put it all together. If three wave fronts are better than two, then maybe four wave fronts are better than three. Okay, and this is looking at this concept of fusion optimized intervals, FOI. So CRT response, if you look at people who had fusion optimized intervals, you had less than 50% non-responders, greater than 50% responders, and greater than 30% super responders. This was a nice paper, uh, it was an acute implant study that looked at the hemodynamics, and when you allowed for a little septal activation, you, get the, you got the greatest hotspot in, in terms of hemodynamic response to CRT. Uh, and this is a combination paper uh, that was seen that as you can incrementally make the QRS better as you add on from best BIV to MPP to sync AV to sync AV plus MPP. So we put this together uh, in, a, in a small study uh, at our place looking at the use of multi-fuse in patients. So we were able to get QRS reduction in our standard left bundle patients, 32%, uh, uh, achieving a QRS of 113 milliseconds. And in the IVCD population, we were able to reduce it 20% uh, to get a QRS of about 116 millisecond. Okay, and again in the paper, this is the multi-fuse formula where we used the determination of SRAT, peel back the sync AV, and then use that specific uh, LV uh, pacing to RV sensing to set up our MPP. And this is sort of what it looks like. Um, here we have the wave fronts, the RV, LV1 and LV2. Okay, and then with the use, excuse me, of the SRAT, we peel back and allow for a little septal activation. So we tr we're thinking that we're getting a four wave front in order to achieve uh, the minimal um, activation time. Okay, so th this is my approach to resynchronization. I'm just trying to massage the electrical system in an atraumatic way, okay? So um, this is, uh, Kaizen, if you know this term, right? It's taking what you have and keep trying to make it better and better and better till you perfect it, okay? It's not jumping to a whole new uh, way of doing things as opposed to traumatic resynchronization. So um, that's... A
actively teaching people to look at, make sure we have notching, which is sort of the EKG representation of the synchrony. And I won't bore you with this, but in order to understand what we're doing, you have to understand how the heart contracts. Um, and really, I won't waste a lot of time on this, but if you um, think about the heart as sort of a double wound rope that has uh, a horizontal and longitudinal contraction, it kind of squeezes down and then springs back up. And if you um, want to listen to Dr. Torrent Gouts, he does an excellent YouTube. It's about a 20 minute presentation. It really shows you how the heart works. And when he goes through this histologically, right, where we know we have to put our LV lead makes sense from an anatomic standpoint, okay? So we know that we're in the right position. So in terms of a summary, um, things can get kind of complicated. And we have all these sort of timing uh, algorithms that, that, to be honest, aren't really used a lot. You know, can we just sort of simplify things by trying to fuse everything? kind of using this formula or a patented approach. Um, in terms of an editorial, can these fusion maneuvers lead to more CRT, no pun intended, for greater, for broader criteria for CRT? So everybody would attack this EKG, but would you attack this EKG, the, the, the IBCD-ish? Or even this one, where to me, honestly, this is, this is a right bundle, but to me it's more interesting that it's a first degree heart block. And in saying that, um, they're already looking at it. This is a nice paper uh, using fusion therapy for right bundle branch, uh, uh, bundle branch block patients, okay? And they had a nice benefit when they used these fusion techniques. So uh, in summary, uh, that's my story of how this patent came about. Um, but uh, multifuse, so what's good for relationships may also good be good for CRT, okay? This is my one approach. There are many ways of doing it. And if I said something that sort of upsets anybody, please forgive me. All right, uh, that's all I have. Thanks, guys. Any questions? Good. Because we timed this out so well, I'm going to the airport. <laughs> I think my, my car is here. <laughs> so, any? Thank you all for your time. Appreciate it. If there are no questions, and if there are questions, I'll take them separately so we can call and get the answer on the way to the airport. No, that's right, yeah. I'll keep my phone on. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Capiciero. All we right, really appreciate thanks. it.